We're joined today by Jan Lacan, uh, who, uh, for those of you who do not know him, he is one of the real godfathers of uh, deep learning, a kind of machine learning that is uh, you know, really sweeping uh, all, all the industries at the moment. It's, it's the kind of artificial intelligence, when people talk about artificial intelligence and, and what's happening in the field, um, they really have this man uh, to thank for at least part of that. Um, Jan uh, is a native of this fair city, uh, did his initial training here, then worked under uh, Jeff Hinton, another one of the great godfathers of AI at the University of Toronto, uh, went to Bell Labs for a while, um, where uh, he pioneered the use of uh, convolutional neural networks, which are, uh, for those who don't know, the, a, a kind of machine learning that underpins most computer vision systems. So self-driving cars, face recognition, uh, they all use CNNs um, to help identify uh, the images. Um, he, is, uh, now, he went to NYU as a professor, uh, and then more recently uh, joined Facebook. Uh, he was the founding director of Facebook's AI research, and now serves as Facebook's uh, chief AI scientist. That's correct, yes? Yes, That's who's great. great. Um, so one of the things uh, Jan is here for, besides this wonderful conference, it's, the, I think, the third anniversary of the opening of their Paris AI lab, Facebook's Paris AI lab. Um, Jan, why, why put an AI lab in Paris? Why did Facebook decide to do that? Well, the, um, the, the key, of course, to a research lab is the, the quality of the, the researchers who are part of it, researchers, research scientists and engineers. And you have to uh, basically get the talents where it is. Um, there, there is a very quickly growing ecosystem uh, in Paris around uh, AI, tech in general. Uh, we mostly recruit research scientists after uh, PhD and uh, most often after a few years of experience uh, in academia or in industry. And this is, Paris is one of the sort of highest concentration of uh, higher education. Uh, there is a long tradition of excellence in, in math and you know, mathematics and, and, and related fields in France, in, in engineering also. And so that was kind of a logical place for us to um, establish a lab here. Yeah. Uh, is there any particular area that that lab has been focusing on or any particular, uh, you know, experiments or, or research in AI that it's particularly uh, focused on? Right. So let me tell you first that um, uh, Facebook AI Research, which is the, the research-oriented arm of uh, AI at Facebook, there is a larger organization uh, that, that we can call Facebook AI, which, you know, works on AI, engineering, product development, et cetera. Facebook AI Research is the part of it that's kind of focused on long-term research, fundamental research. Uh, and uh, uh, practices open research. There's about 150 people uh, total, more like 160 now actually, at Facebook AI Research, spread between uh, Paris, uh, New York, where I'm based, Menlo Park in California, the headquarters of the company. Uh, we have a smaller lab in Montreal that we created about a year ago, and uh, three kind of satellite labs, one in Pittsburgh that was recently announced, one in uh, Seattle, and one in Tel Aviv. Um, and uh, the Paris lab is actually the largest. It has about, about 50, 50 people, roughly, and is growing really fast. And there is no sort of geographic distribution of any topic, so any lab in any location can work on anything, basically. Right. But naturally, people sort of concentrate. So uh, in Paris, there is a lot of research on uh, natural language understanding, dialogue systems, and things of that type, uh, a little bit on translation as well. And uh, also because of the uh, tradition of excellence in France in image processing and computer vision, there is quite a lot of activities in computer vision. And then uh, on, on theory, sort of the mathematics of machine learning and AI, if you want. Um, so there's been a number of projects uh, uh, done either entirely in Paris or partially in Paris in collaboration with other labs that have had a, a big impact on the company. Um, one of them is called uh, FastText. It's actually an open source uh, piece of software that you can download, but it's used inside the company as well. This is for uh, essentially text classification, for representing text as kind of vectors, as a list of numbers, so you can kind of process, figure out if two pieces of text, you know, text talk about the same thing or whether they um, you know, say opposite things to each other, you know, things like that, um, and uh, you know, classify the topic, um, uh, things of that type. Uh, another piece of software that also was uh, developed in Paris and was uh, open sourced is called uh, FISS, F-A-I-S-S, -S, that means Facebook AI Similarity Search. And it's a library for performing very, very fast uh, similarity search between objects of any kind, uh, computer objects of any kind. So for image search, text search, et cetera, for indexing. And it's used very, very widely in the company by many product groups. 
Hmm. Um, and then there are other projects that are also open source, but they are more kind of research oriented, which may, right. maybe we'll talk about next. Sure. Yeah, um, obviously Facebook has been in the news a lot this past uh, 18 months. Um, you know, one of the reasons it's been in the news uh, has been the whole controversy over alleged Russian uh, election meddling in the US elections, uh, fake news. Um, when uh, your CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, has testified before Congress on this, he, he keeps saying that, well, eventually AI will be the answer to the, these problems. Uh, as someone who's sort of at the bleeding edge of this technology, I guess I wanted to ask you sort of when will, will that be possible and, and how? I mean, okay. is, and is, you know, are, is AI going to be able to solve this? And, and if so, on what time scale? So AI is certainly part of the answer, but it's not the only answer. So you know, Facebook has been hiring a lot of uh, what we call moderators, so people who review content that has been either flagged by AI systems or flagged by users. And they choose whether you know, they should be kept on the, uh, uh, on the network or not. Um, so there's a number of different tasks of this type, some for which AI works really well today. Um, and some for which they don't work so well, mm. and for which we need to do uh, to make a lot of progress for them to work. So a good example of where it works, if, if you want to detect terrorist propaganda, it's actually fairly straightforward because a lot of the content is reused by a lot of different uh, entities, and so by basically matching where the two images are the same or where the texts are very similar, you can catch you know, over 99% of terrorist propaganda and just take it out before anyone sees it. Uh, those statistics, by the way, are published by Facebook. There is kind of a blog post that explains uh, all of this. Um, things like taking down fake accounts, um, which are used by things like you know, right. uh, uh, some Russian agencies and things like that. Uh, that works pretty well, too. And it's been deployed only over the last few months. So it's not something that was done before the American elections, but, right. for example. But it, was, it started uh, uh, right after, and it kind of you know, actually played a role in uh, European elections uh, of like, you know, preventing uh, the worst from, from happening there. Um, so fake accounts being taken down. Um, uh, there is uh, hate speech detection. So hate speech detection is harder. Uh, for example, if, uh, 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 you know, a neo-Nazi group, um, you know, posts something very obnoxious, uh, that's pretty easy to detect just from the text um, mm. automatically. So that's probably gonna be taken down. Now, if a civil liberty group wants to point what this, what this other group has uh, right. said and, and makes a quotation of it. Yeah. You know, how is an AI system supposed to know that this is not a hateful speech, it's right. actually a quote from so a hateful the, speech. So the, or, the understanding of context is still something right. that we don't so this, ha haven't mastered. That's right, so there's context, there is irony, um, you know, things like that which, are, which AI still have, AI techniques or natural language processing techniques still have a bit of uh, trouble with. But still, I think, if I remember correctly, about 75% of hate speech uh, is taken down automatically. The rest is sort of flagged by users, handled by moderators. And then the, the last one is uh, false news, and that's very, very hard. AI is nowhere near mm. being able to solve that problem. Some of it is uh, flagged automatically, but um, you know, who is to say that a piece of news is false or not? You know, it depends on your opinion sometimes. Right. Um, and, and so that's a much harder problem. Right. So it sounds like progress is being made on, on some of these fronts very rapidly and others yeah. less so. Exactly. Uh, in general, I mean, we've, we've seen huge advances in computer vision. Um, I think that technology has gone a lot further than people even expected in a short period of time. On, on these uh, issues involving natural language processing and understanding, it seems like we still are lagging further behind. Why, why is that? Why isn't natural language caught up to where vision is? Okay, so it's, it's tempting to think that there is a difference between those different application areas, computer vision, language, understanding, translation, and then perhaps other areas like you know, self-driving cars or whatever, uh, robotics, you know, control. Uh, the difference or the, 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 the characteristic that de determines whether AI is applicable or works well in those conditions or not uh, is whether the, solving the task requires a lot of background knowledge or not. So if you want to train a system to recognize objects and images, even if it's obscure species of birds just from their picture, um, it's relatively specialized knowledge. You only need to look at the picture. You don't need to have any other kind of knowledge. And if you can collect thousands of examples of each of the categories, you can train a convolutional net, uh, right. for example, to, to recognize those categories. That works really well. It works uh, to some extent at you know, a superhuman level, or at least for most humans. We're yeah. not experts at right. recognizing birds and you know, dog breeds. Yeah. Um, translation sort of works. Uh, it it's works sufficiently well to be useful. So it's the same thing. You, you, you take uh, a large corpus of text in, say, uh, French and English, and you can train a system to translate from one to the other. The system doesn't have a very deep understanding of what, right, what the text said, says. Yes. And so sometimes it, it makes sort of right. 
you know, stupid yeah. mistakes. Um, and then if you want to translate, you know, um, I don't know, Urdu to Swahili, you know, you, basically there is no data set for that. Right. So one thing that the Paris Lab has been working on is a system called Muse, uh, which we actually released in open source recently. It was announced at F8 by uh, Mark Schoeffer, okay. our CTO. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting experiment that consists in taking uh, a corpus of text in two languages, representing the words or the snippets of text by, by vectors, basically a list of numbers. And then you get basically a, a, cloud of, a cloud of points for one language, a cloud of points for another language. And by trying to match the shape of those clouds, you can actually generate a dictionary oh. without ever having no, what seen any data, yeah. you know, parallel it's data from those two languages. So you can yeah. sort of imagine that in the future, we'll be able to actually translate a lot more languages. You right. know, people on Facebook use something like 5,000 langu sure. different languages. It's yeah. enormous. Uh, that's really interesting. Uh, what, one of the areas that people are sort of worried about um, is that you have systems, uh, you have these uh, GANs, generative adversarial networks. People have been using them to generate uh, false video images, false, right. uh, false images. There's this concern that that could be you know, fake news on steroids, as it were, um, and that this is you know, the, the potential malicious uses of some of this technology is running way ahead of our ability to police that or to come up with solutions that stop that. How worried are you about kind of malicious uses of AI? So you know, um, every time a new medium appears, there is this kind of uh, question that people have. You know, we, you know, this could be more more ways for uh, nefarious actors to fool us, right? Right. But we learn too. Okay, we're, <laughs> we're very adaptable, and so you know, we've learned to interpret messages on radio and TV, um, uh, you know, to what they're worth, uh, or or pictures, or pictures on the internet. You know, a lot of them are are uh, um, manipulated, right. and it's hard for the human eye to detect that. It's actually not that hard for an automated system to figure out that the picture has been uh, manipulated. So there is some research on this. It's, it tends not to be too public, because if you make it too public, then it be, becomes easier to break. So, right. um, but, but there is quite a bit of work on uh, training AI systems to actually de detect if an image has been artificially generated or if it's been uh, doctored, essentially. Right. So AI is the problem, but AI is the answer, maybe. Well, that, to, that to, one, some to some extent. You know, it's my AI is better than your yeah, AI, right. basically. You know? yeah. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you, I, there's you know, a lot of hype around AI and what, and what AI can do. Uh, machine learning is being deployed everywhere. Um, but at the same time, you have, you have people who are sort of, often some of your contemporaries who are sort of made fundamental contributions to the field, questioning how much progress are we making towards this idea of artificial general intelligence, that we'll ever have machines that are smarter than the average human at a, ra a wide range of skills as opposed to one narrow skill. And I, I know uh, uh, Judea Pearl recently has, has published a book where he says, you know, all of, all of this deep learning is great at finding correlation, but it has no idea about causation, and that you know, what we really need is systems that can have a theory of causation if we're going to make progress. What, what do you think about what he's saying? And, and as someone who's worked in a lot of deep learning systems, you know, is that a problem, that we are going to assume that these systems can do more than they can actually do? OK, well, there is, there's a lot of questions packed uh, okay, into yeah, this, yeah, small, sure, this yeah. small question. So let's, let's address uh, the, Judy Pearl's uh, yeah. recent book and the, the press that has been around this. So it is not true that people who work on deep learning don't work on causation. In fact, there is probably, I would say, half a dozen people at Facebook right. who work on uh, what's called causal inference, so inferring uh, causal relationships by observation. Mm -hmm. uh, my good friend and colleague, Leon Botou, for example, has been doing very interesting work with Maxine Ocab, who is here in, in Paris. Uh, Leon is, is in New York. Uh, also with David Lopez Paz, who is also in Paris, on uh, basically establishing a causal relationship just by observation. It turns out the, the classical way of establishing causation is that you, for example, you want to see, you want to know if a particular medicine cures a particular disease, right? So you have two populations. You, there's one population you give the medicine, the other one you just give a placebo, and then you can randomize the experiments. You make sure nobody knows uh, who is given what. And then at the end, you, you, by statistics, you figure out, you know, it, it, was, there a, was there an effect? And the effect has to be causal the, because you, know, you observe the effect after the, after the cause. Um, and so it was you know, very uh, well established in statistics that you can only establish causation if you perturb a system. But in fact, you can establish some types of causation just by observation. Mm. And that's really very interesting. Uh, but it's true that there are lots of questions. In fact, Leon wrote a, a beautiful article about this uh, about five years ago on 
the, the sort of causation loops that happen when you have very right. complex systems and involve machine learning systems that they can get you know trapped into their own kind of you know kind of you right. know bite their own tail and things like this. So so causation is a very important issue. We're working on it. Uh, it, ha it is not in opposition to deep learning. It's something you can use deep learning for. Right. Okay. Um, uh, that's, that's, yeah. that's clearly. Now, um, for the, the broader question mm. of artificial general intelligence, it may or may not use explicit causation, uh, causal inference mechanisms. We, we don't know yet. But one thing that... Do you think you could get there without, without causation? Well, could... I think causation would probably turn out to, or, or causal inference would turn out to be perhaps a, an interesting side effect of some kind of more general thing that, that oh. we'll come up with. Um, so uh, I think what, what's missing is the ability for machines to learn kind of like animals and humans by essentially observing the world and acting in it. Uh, right now, all the learning that is done with, with machines is either, reinf uh, either reinforcement learning or supervised learning. So supervised learning is this, you know, what we use for translation and image recognition, show an image of a dog to a machine. If it doesn't say dog, tell it you got, you got it wrong. It adjusts its internal parameters so that next time right. you show the same image, yeah. it gets closer, sure. right? Yeah. Um, Reinforcement learning is what is used in games a lot. Yeah. So you get a machine to play millions of games of, of Go, for example, or chess against itself. And uh, you know, it adjusts uh, its strategy so that it uses, it reinforces the strategy that wins uh, and kind of de-emphasize the one that loses. And right. as, as it plays more and more games, it kind of you know, uh, ends up yeah. in just uh, a few hours, a few days, or a few weeks, depending on how many yeah, computers so you have, you can you know, beat any human. AlphaGo, superhuman AlphaGo, AlphaGo right. Zero. Yeah. Again, uh, Facebook just recently open sourced uh, a Go engine called OpenGo, right. uh, Elf OpenGo, which uh, uh, works very much like AlphaGo yeah. Zero, um, but is open source, AlphaGo right. Zero isn't. I, want, I wanted to ask you about another sort of hot topic in the field, which has to do with explainability. That you know, one of the things that's holding mm -hmm. uh, deployment of deep learning back, particularly in some, some safety critical or uh, in cases where it might be making decisions about people's financial futures, is the idea that these uh, purely deep learning systems are black boxes, that we can't explain how they exactly arrive at their decisions or recommendations or classifications. Um, uh, you've sort of controversially said that you know, if uh, the problem that with a lot of explainable ability right now is that uh, the ways to make these things explainable also make them less effective, and that you'd rather have systems that are more effective versus explainable. Is that, is that That's right? That's not what I That's said. That's not what you said. No, okay. No. Well, why don't you explain what, what, what you actually think about this issue of explainability? Okay. So first of all, uh, to give you an idea of the scale, uh, Facebook uh, runs per day around 200 trillion, American trillions, okay? Um, so 200 trillion, that's a two with 14 zeros behind it. 200 trillion predictions per day, where prediction is basically running a machine learning system to, to make a prediction. And it can be as simple as deciding, you know, in what order to show you the stuff on your newsfeed. And that happens several times a day per use, Facebook user, right. right? 200 trillion per day, that's an enormous number. Most of those, you will not ever want explanations for them just because of the volume right. and nobody is really interested. Now, when the decisions are decisions that are really important for people that really affect their lives, obviously you, you, know, you want to be able to provide an explanation. Now, um, what I said is that whenever I was in the situation where I faced uh, a potential user of a, of a machine learning system, uh, a customer, let's call it this way, yeah. um, who uh, had a choice between a simple system that they thought they understood uh, but didn't work that well. And another one that worked better, but was more of a deep neural net that, you know, f for which they didn't understand it. It's not that it was less explainable, it's just right. that they didn't understand as well how it worked. Right. Every single time they need to make a choice, they choose the second one. So performance is, is, is paramount, right? Um, uh, explainability is considerably less important, as a matter right. of fact. Um, so, um, um, now, the question is, can we generate explanations for decisions that are made by neural nets? And the answer is yes. Yeah. Th those are not any less explainable than other statistical right. models. I want to, we're almost out of time. I want to take a, a question uh, from the audience. Um, someone asked that you know, AI went through this uh, symbolic AI, which was this other form of AI, went through a, a period of tremendous hype. And then there was this thing called an AI winter, or several of them actually, <laughs> where funding dried up. The, the technology never lived up to the hype. This person wants to know, are we? potentially going to suffer another AI winter, will a lot of the deep learning systems ultimately prove not to be able to live up to their promise? Well, it depends what promise you believe in. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of promises that are being delivered today and for which you know, there will be a huge impact on, on society. I think uh, my colleague Andrew Ng said that um, 
you know, even if we stop research today, just the, uh, uh, you know, trying to kind of disseminate the technology to, to use the technology we currently have in all corners of the economy will, will already have a huge impact. Uh, but of course, you know, what we're working on is actually pushing the technology forward. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, impact in, uh, in, in, in healthcare medicine and, in, in, you know, biomedicine in general, transportation, obviously, with sort of in cars and other things or, you know, security. Even if we don't have completely autonomous cars 10, 15 years from now, we'll have cars that are a lot safer because they will have to help us drive. Um, so it will save people. I mean, it will save lives. It's as simple as that. And then, you know, it will probably reorganize how uh, cities are organized and things like that. It will change uh, uh, a lot of things in industry for automation, etc. It will make the price of physical widgets go down because automation will be even more widely spread than it is now. It will probably change the kind of geopolitical relationship of like who builds what. You know, now a lot of widgets are built in China, but you know, if they're built by completely by machines, then you know, that may completely change where, where you can build them. So uh, there's gonna be a huge impact. Now, are we gonna have personal virtual assistants that are not frustrating to talk to, that actually understand what we talk about? Translation systems that don't kind of misunderstand what they see in one language? Right. Uh, are we gonna have, uh, uh, you know, dexterous robots? You know, household robots that can fill your, your uh, Dishwasher, you know, very yeah, simple. Yeah. We don't have the technology today because we are limited to those two forms of learning, supervised and reinforcement learning. One form of learning that we don't know how to do, um, you know, some people have called it self-supervised learning or unsupervised learning. It's the kind of learning that animals and humans uh, practice. That's, that's how we learn how the world works. We don't yet know how to do this with machines. We're working very actively on this. You know, we might, we might come on, on the breakthrough two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, we don't know. So if it takes too long, if it takes longer than the time that people funding or research expects, mm. then there's gonna be a winter. Right. Uh, but it's not gonna be a complete winter in the sense that there is a huge industry right now around the current technology of machine learning and that's just not going away. Great, we're out of time, I'm afraid. Um, but Jan, thank you so much for, thank you. for coming and speaking with us. Uh, Jan LeCon, everyone. <laughs>